Interesting historical fact, most books on child rearing were addressed to fathers, you know, not to mothers as they are today, um, because fathers were considered the primary parent. And they did, in fact, spend as much time with their children throughout the day as mothers did. It's hard for us to imagine that because we're so used to men being out of the home all day. But in fact, you know, boy, especially, especially with their boys, right? Men were training them in the adult skills that they would need. Professor Nancy Piercy comes to us in this conversation from Houston in Texas and care of modern technology. I'm from my farm in northwest New South Wales. Professor Piercy is a best-selling author and speaker. Her work has appeared in no less than the Washington Post, the Washington Times, First Things, Human Events, CNS News and Fox News. She's currently a professor and scholar in residence at Houston Christian University, Texas. Her latest book is The Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes. Professor Piercy, I can't help asking you at the outset in this modern age of uh, different communications and so forth, uh, you mentioned when we were chatting earlier that you have Australians who have enrolled uh, at uh, your university. Yes, I love it. Um, some of them are registered students, but some are auditing. So auditing students are people who are just doing it for personal enrichment, not for credit. And yes, I have had a number of students from Australia. So that's been a lot of fun. I've gotten to interact with them and um, from around the world. And in my classes, they actually come in. It's, it's at the same time. It's synchronous, right? So that means they actually are part of the discussion. They came, They come in on Zoom and there's a screen on the wall. So the whole class gets to see them and they get to see us. And so it's almost like having them in the classroom and they participate, they ask questions, they answer questions. And so it's with, a, like you said, modern technology, we have Australian students who are active participants right in the classroom. Well, that's fantastic. Well, if we could kick off, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I read a beautiful piece of yours, which contrasted good men with real men in an age of, I think we'd all agree, great confusion amongst young men, especially about what it means to be a man in our convoluted culture today. Uh, and, and you sort of describe somebody who might be talked of as a good man at their eulogy versus the sort of uh, idea that we get of a real man who often is not a very admirable character at all today. What were you driving at? Can you bring that story to life for us? Yes, it's actually a sociological study that was done. Um, he's a fairly prominent sociologist, Michael Kimmel, and so he speaks all around the world. And the reason I put this, by the way, at the front of the book is that this has proven to be the most controversial book I've written. And that actually took me by surprise because my previous book, um, Love Thy Body, was on issues like abortion, homosexuality, transgenderism. And yet, oddly enough, masculinity has been more of a trigger word and it has promoted more uh, controversy than any of my previous books. And so I found it helpful to put this study right at the front. Um, the sociologist, uh, when he was in his speaking around the world, he would ask young men two questions. He would start with, what does it mean to be a good man? In a eulogy, like you said, if somebody says he was a good man, what does that mean? And he said, all around the world, young men had no trouble answering that question. They would immediately start listing things like honor, duty, integrity, sacrifice, do the right thing, look out for the little guy, be a protector, be a provider, be responsible. And the sociologist would ask them, where'd you learn that? And they would say, I don't know. It's just in the air we breathe. Or if they were in a Western country, they would often say it's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. But then he would follow up with a second question where he said, what would, it, what would it mean if I said to you, man up, be a real man? And the young men themselves said, no, 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 that's completely different. That means be tough, be strong, never show weakness, win at all costs, um, be, a, be, be competitive, get rich, and get laid. I'm using their language. And so the sociologist concluded from this experiment that 
all around the world, young men do have a sense of what it means to be the good man, right? Because this was global. This is universal. And so apparently it's innate. You know, it's inherent. I would say they're made in God's image. And so they do know what it means to be the good man. But they also feel cultural pressure to be the real man, according to certain cultural expectations. And like you said, that often is quite different. And certainly if those traits are disconnected from a moral ideal, it can slide into things like dominance and control and entitlement and the things that we tend today to call toxic. And so that was really helpful because what it means is, you know, you don't have to be either for or against masculinity. You can say, you know, we encourage men to be the good man, to live up to what they know intrinsically, inherently, innately. It means to be a good man. Um, and, and we can think critically about our cultural messages at the same time that may not be so healthy and so positive. It seems to me then that a lot of young men are really caught between two stools. Some of them think, OK, I'll be a real man, and then they get absolutely condemned. The rest watch on and think, if I do the wrong thing here, uh, I'm a misogynist. Uh, and I don't know how to be a good man either. They sort of fall between these two few, these two sort of uh, stools. How has this happened? How have we reached this point where so many young men are confused about what it, what the expectations of them are and how to perform in the society where basically the charge of misogyny is bandied around with an extraordinary freedom. Yes, yeah. I, ha I started my book with some of those examples because they were they were shocking. the The Washington Post had an article titled "Why Can't We Hate Men?" <laughs> really, in a mainstream really? publication. Uh, and a Huffington Post editor tweeted hashtag Kill All Men, and you can buy T shirts that are supposed to be funny. Uh, so many men, so little ammunition. And some books are really quite blunt. They have titles like, I hate men, and no good men, and a men necessary. So it, this is what boys are growing up with. And by the way, I found examples from men as well. There's a male author who wrote a book in which he said, talking about healthy masculinity is like talking about healthy cancer. And this one was more recent, so you might have seen it. It was in the news. The director of the movie Avatar James Cameron, was in the news saying um, testosterone is a toxin that you have to work out of your system. And so no wonder young men are growing up being confused. And I, I quoted a, a, a psychotherapist who writes regularly for the Wall Street Journal. And she said, the, the young men coming into my practice are increasingly feeling beaten down, demoralized, defeated, because they feel like they're growing up in a culture that's hostile to masculinity. And by the way, when I told my class at Houston Christian University that I was writing a book on masculinity, one of my male students shot back, what masculinity? It's been beaten out of us. So it's, it's everywhere. You know, even in a Christian school, young men are feeling that the culture is, is hostile to masculinity. And that's why I wrote the book is because I wanted to ask, where is this coming from? How can we understand it better? You can't stand against a social trend unless you can say, well, here's where it's from, you know, and here's how we can counter it. So that was that's the goal of my book is to understand where it comes from and you know how, how can we fix this trend? It is extraordinary. It seems that uh, in the West, right across the West, we we're at war over race. We're at war between the generations. And we're at war between the sexes. And the great irony here is that men are apparently uh, almost universally misogynist, according to many feminists. And yet they, in that, are displaying great hatred of men themselves. Yeah, you know, let me give you just another uh, another study, because this was another, it was another global one. I like starting with the good news. <laughs> this was a global study done this time by an anthropologist named, named David Gilmore. And he wanted to, uh, it was actually the first ever cross-cultural study of concepts of masculinity. And what he found was that um, despite cultural differences, all cultures share a common code of what it means to be a good man. Um, and he puts it this way, 
all cultures expect that the man will perform what he called the three Ps, provide, protect, and procreate. In other words, become a father, build into the next generation. And so once again, I found that really encouraging that in spite of all the negative um, lingo, the negative messages that men get today, there was a universal sense that men seem to have. And like I said, again, this one was global. And so it, it didn't. De- it did not depend on what cultural background you were coming from, that men understood that their unique strengths, you know, because men are bigger, stronger, faster, more aggressive because of testosterone. But men do understand that their strengths were not given them just to get whatever they want, but to provide, protect, to care for, even to fight for if necessary the people that they love, the people they're responsible for. You can understand why some men find it difficult, though, in a modern society where everything's done for you and where it's assumed that there'll be no harm done and that words are bullets, how they might exercise that testosterone-charged instinct to protect and provide and to procreate. You know, it's, it's as though there's no room to exercise those. Those things are immediately pay, painted as overbearing and inappropriate. Uh, to flip the question, we're busily describing masculinity as toxic all over the place. Is there such a thing as toxic femininity, do you think? A female equivalent? What, what might it look like? Because it seems to me there's a fair bit of hatred coming from I don't think there's any other word for it, frankly. Hatred for men coming from certain quarters of the feminist movement. Yeah, so I do talk about the history of that as well, because most people think toxic masculinity, the the concept maybe arose in the 1960s, second wave feminism. It actually goes much further back, and, and we need to understand that if we're going to counter it effectively. It turns out it goes all the, back, all the way back to the 19th century. You can see... I was surprised when I read the literature of the 19th century that it was often just as hostile as what we see today. And what people were protesting against actually was as Western society secularized, the concept of masculinity changed. Let's start with the the Industrial Revolution. Before that, most men worked with their family members, you know, with their wives and children all day in the family industry, the family farm, the family business. And so the cultural expectation on men focused much more on their caretaking role. In fact, hist- interesting historical fact, most books on child rearing were addressed to fathers, you know, not to mothers as they are today, um, because fathers were considered the primary parent. And they did, in fact, spend as much time with their children throughout the day as mothers did. It's hard for us to imagine that because we're so used to men being out of the home all day. But in fact, you know, boy, especially especially with their boys, right? Men were training them in the adult skills that they would need. And I think it's interesting that even uh, secular historians will say uh, the the concept of masculine virtue at that time was duty to God and man. You know, a sense of duty was very strong in the, in the colonial era. I start with them. I, I'm, I limit my uh, discussion to America just to keep it limited. Um, But where did we lose that? The Industrial Revolution took men out of the home, right? It it took work out of the home, and men had to follow their work into offices and factories. And for the first time, they were not working alongside their family members, people they loved and had a moral bond with. Instead, they were working as individuals in competition with other men. And that's when we see the literature start to change. You start to see people protesting that men were losing their caretaking ethos, that they were becoming egocentric, uh, self-centered, aggressive, greedy and acquisitive, to use the language of the day, treating their uh, job as their idol, you know, getting their self-identity not from their family relationships, but from individual achievement in the workplace. And on top of that, you know, as the Industrial Revolution um, built up a large public sphere of institutions like factories and offices and financial institutions and universities and the state, people began to argue that these large public institutions should be run by scientific principles, by which they meant value-free. In other words, don't bring your private values into the public realm. And since it was men who were getting that secular education and working in that secular realm, 
they also began to be less governed by more traditional theistic Christian understandings of masculinity. And so the historians agree that the 19th century saw a huge increase of drinking, gambling, gang activity, crime, prostitution, because men were becoming more secular in their outlook. And the 19th century, as a result, was also the period of great reform movements. But the reform movements were all basically focused on male misbehavior, that men were starting to act differently because they were no longer embedded in their family, in their church, you know, in their local community anymore. So historically, if you go back to the 19th century, it's amazing how already then you see the language. Well, let me give you a quote. So this, one of my favorite historians puts it this way. All of, the, all of the reform movements of the 19th century were implicit condemnations of males. Why? Because there was little doubt as to the sex of the tavern keeper, the slave master, the drunkard, and the seducer. That's her, her quote. So a lot of the hostile language toward men actually goes back to that era. And of course, that does also indicate what the solution must be. The solution has to be, how can we reconnect men to their families? How can we reconnect men to their children and especially the next generation of sons? Uh, a psychiatrist wrote a book in which he said, we're not going to get a better class of men until we get a better class of fathers you know, raising the next generation. So in my book, I end up make, you know, saying that the long-term solution is to recover, especially the father-son relationship. That's the main, the main uh, solution to any sort of toxic behavior in men. Just drawing on that history for a moment, uh, Nancy, uh, I was surprised to learn from your book um, that you made the point that the vote was not necessarily popular with women back when female suffrage was being uh, debated. That seems extraordinary to our, uh, our ears, the idea that there would have been women who thought this was not a good idea. Was that somehow part and parcel of this attempt to rein men in that you're talking about and bring them back to the drawing board? Absolutely. Back to involvement? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, and I, I didn't realize how controversial that section of the book would be, but I've had a lot of people co contradict, you know, like, what? But so I was very careful to quote people of the time. I have several quotes from the anti-suffragists of the day. And what they argued was they were not arguing male ver vote versus female vote. They framed it as individual vote versus family vote or household vote. Right. And they were uh, very concerned that if men started uh, acting in, you know, unilaterally as an individual and voting, that he would no longer feel constrained to represent the whole household. And and they, that was that was their concern is that it, it was reducing the sense of responsibility on men. That was their concern. It was letting men off the hook, right? It was saying, you know, oh, you, you can go vote however you want and not think about the impact on your whole family, your whole household. Remember, households were bigger than just a nuclear, nuclear family then, too. Usually it was extended family and, and possibly servants and hired hands and others, you know, would all. And, and the, the father was the head of that small commonwealth and was supposed to vote for the interest of the whole. In fact, the whole notion of authority back then. You know, today we think authority kind of means I get to do what I want. Back then, the concept of authority was you have responsibility for the common good of the whole. It came out of classical republicanism. But that was the the father was considered not just an individual, but he spoke for the whole. He had responsibility for the common good of the whole. And so that's what people were afraid that would be lost, that it was a much bigger question than we tend to realize that it was a question of whether we would lose a political philosophy that focused on the common good and making the person an authority responsible for the common good of the whole. And so that would affect families. Of course, it affects churches and schools and civil society as well. But here we're talking specifically about how it affected fathers. And how did we lose that? Well, first it started when we had universal male suffrage. You know, when men could vote, even if they weren't head of household. Well, then women looked at that and said, well, wait a minute. Men are already voting as individuals. If men are voting as individuals, they're not taking the household into account. Then we'd better have the vote. You know, and it's kind of poignant because you read the quotes from the day. And literally, one of the a labor union leader, a uh, female, said, 
women need the vote because men, even good men, cannot be trusted to take our interest into account. So the shift in political philosophy that said the person in authority no longer ha- is responsible for the common good meant women felt like they were no longer being protected by a man who represented the household. So that was really quite sad. That was a, 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 an important step in women losing their trust that men would, in fact, take responsibility for their whole family and household. That's an interesting light, in a sense, to shine on the fact that, believe it or not, uh, Australia and New Zealand were the first places where uh, the, the vote was extended to women. It happened in New Zealand first, although the laws to allow women to vote first happened in South Australia, the state of South Australia, down here quite early on. And in South Australia, it was led by, interestingly, Christian women, the Women's, Christ- the women's Temperance Alliance, it was known as. And they must have already reached the point where they felt their men were not necessarily to be trusted with looking after their best interests in terms of uh, the thinking that you put forward, which may very yes, well have took- been true. They might have been right. Yeah. Well, it took a it took a century. It took roughly a century. Yes, eventually women came around to supporting the vote, and why um, the women's? You're right here in in the states as well. The women's temperance movement start, uh, changed their mind on the vote. But here's what they did: they renamed the vote um, the ballot for home protection. The women's temperance movement said we need to give women the vote because women who have alcoholic husbands who are coming home and beating them, have no recourse. And so if women have the vote, they can hold men in check. Remember, this is the temperance movement. So they're very concerned that men are drinking away the family money and they're coming home and beating their wives and children. And so they eventually came to see the vote as a way of giving women a voice for temperance. You have to put this in context. Sometimes a single fact can help. In 1830, Americans drank more three times as much as they do today. So there's a reason there was a temperance movement. You know, public drunkenness had become quite a problem. You know, people falling down drunk in the alleys and so on. And so you're right. Eventually, women started saying uh, the vote is going to give women some leverage against these male vices, in particular alcoholism that's destroying our families. So that's why they changed their perspective and began to support the vote. Takes us right back, doesn't it, to to, uh, to this divide that we need to understand between a good man and, inverted commas, a real man uh, behaving irresponsibly. And so you see this emergence, as I understand you putting it to us, that understandably women are saying we need protection from men who behave badly. We need them to step up and accept their responsibilities and do things properly. But we now live in an age when it seems that the feminists and many of the writers, uh, that um, the, the essential problem is Christianity, that it's been disastrous for women, that it teaches about male dominance, women as helpers, I have to say, as as a believing Christian, I've never understood that because, to my way of thinking, Christianity insists on the equal worth and dignity of every individual, um, regardless of gender, regardless of any other range of factors, intelligence or skin colour. But leaving that aside, um, this this idea that Christianity is at the heart of all of this, you have, I think, a very different perspective. What would you say history actually teaches us? Yeah, so I I kind of stumbled across these sociological studies of Christian men when I was doing my research, and I was I was blown away. I I had no idea. Um, I you know like like you, we've all heard the narrative that Christian men are Exhibit A of toxic masculinity. I'll give you just one example. It was easy to find, <laughs> lots of them, but uh, the the co-founder of the Church Two movement, which followed the Me Too movement. Um, said, the theology of male headship feeds the rape culture that we see permeating American Christianity today. And so what happened is the social social scientists were listening to these accusations and saying, but where's your evidence? You're making these charges, but where's your data? So they went out and did the studies of Christian couples. And I quote some dozen or so different studies and they found the exact opposite. They found that the facts totally 
um, debunk the secular narrative, the, the dominant cultural narrative, that Christian men who actually attend church regularly, you know, who are sincere, who are motivated, um, who are committed, actually test out at the highest in terms of being the most loving husbands and fathers. Uh, their wives report the highest level of happiness with the way their husbands treat them. Evangelical men spend more time with their children than any other group, 3.5 hours more per week than secular fathers. Christ, uh, evangelical couples divorce at the lowest rate of any group, 35% lower than secular couples, and they have the lowest rate of domestic abuse and violence of any group in America. So this is incredibly surprising for most of us to hear. Uh, sometimes a quote will crystallize it. So let me give you a quote. Um, the, the, the man who did, the sociologist who did the largest study was Brad Wilcox at the University of Virginia. And uh, to give you a sense of his stature, he gets published in places like the New York Times. So this is uh, from a New York Times article that he published. Uh, direct quote, it turns out that the happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. Uh, they focus on the wives, of course, is because the assumption is that these marriages are oppressive to wives. Um, but no, the happiest of all wives in America are religious conservatives. Fully 73% of women who hold conservative gender values and attend church regularly with their husbands have high quality marriages. So this is not a pep talk from some religious leader. This is, you know, firm social science data. This is, these are evidence-based findings that we should be bold about bringing into the public square to debunk the secular narrative. And I would suggest also bringing it into the church to encourage Christian men that they're actually doing quite well by objective measures. And because the churches don't always encourage men either. I, one of my graduate students works for a very large uh, Baptist church here in Houston, you know, a mega church. And she said, um, on Mother's Day, we hand out flowers and tell the women they're wonderful. On Father's Day, we scold the men and tell them to do better. So in my book, I was very careful <laughs> not to have a scolding tone. I think it's time for us to, in the churches as well, to start building up men and affirming and encouraging them that by objective me measures, they are actually doing very well. We have had quite a bit of publicity around supposed studies showing that um, evangelical men are more prone to violence because of the headship stuff. Um, I think your work would suggest that there is a sort of a category of men who are on the edges, who pick up and interpret out of context uh, the idea of male responsibility and abuse it, that give everyone a bad name. Your research, I think, would back that up a bit. There, there are sort of people on the fringes rather than people who are deeply committed to their faith who actually do behave quite badly. Yes, and by the way, um, there were there were some news items from Australia that I do that I do include in the book, um, because there were some public public debates in Australia about this issue. So the first pushback I always get is, "But wait a minute, haven't we all heard that Christians divorce at the same rate as everyone else?" And so the researchers went back to the data and they made that important distinction that you just mentioned. They said, "Okay, there's there's these committed Christian men, but what about?" nominal Christian men. So now my, my students don't even know what that word means. So I have to tell them uh, nominal N O M is Latin for name. So it means in name only. And these are men who on a survey like this might check the Baptist box, for example, uh, but who actually attend church rarely, if at all. And these men test out shockingly different. They, they fit all the toxic stereotypes they, their wives report the lowest level of happiness. Um, they spend the least amount of time with their children. Th these couples actually divorce at a higher rate than even secular men, 20% higher than secular men. And they have the highest rate of domestic abuse and violence, even higher than secular men. So this is why the statistics get so skewed, because if you just say evangelical or Protestant or Christian, you're going to get men who are better than secular men, <laughs> men who are worse 
than succulent man. And so the, the numbers are going to be misleading. And so this was the first time that, that research just actually separated them out so that we can understand what's happening. And yet, like you say, it is the nominal Christian men who are therefore, and in the West, we have a lot. We have a lot of sort of cultural Christians who don't really believe it in a personal sense, where it's just that a cultural background, family background. And um, it, the one study I found that gave the actual numbers, it's about the same, the same size, the same number of Christians on both sides. And so it, a lot of people are getting the negative understandings, the negative view of Christian men from these nominals who, in fact, are worse. By the way, some people ask me, why would they be worse than secular men? And the answer seems to be that a secular man who is maybe hitting his wife and kids at least does not feel any religious justification for what he's doing. But the nominal Christian man is hanging around the fringes of the Christian world enough to pick up language like headship and submission. Um, he infuses those words with meanings from the secular world, but he feels religious justification for what he's doing. And then he ends up being the worst having the worst, the worst of both worlds, right? He ends up having the Christian language, but behaving worse than secular men. So this is a challenge uh, for churches, for example. You know, how on the one on the one hand, how can you use this data to really encourage the men who are doing well over against you know a very hostile environment? You know, in terms of the the secular world, thinking that Christians are, like you said, attacking Christians as being the worst uh, of the. Uh, of the toxic men. But on the other hand, how can Christians reach out to these men at the, at the fringes? You know, is there a way to have a discipleship program that reaches out to them and says, you know, you need to get a biblical understanding of these terms. You know, you you are out there, you know, in a sense, creating a negative reputation for Christians because you're not actually living it out. You're actually living out a secular view. And by the way, that's another reason that I wanted to write this book, because what is the secular view? So that we can have a critical grid, right? If you don't know, if you don't have a critical grid, you will just absorb ideas from your culture. Uh, and so we need a critical grid that helps us to distinguish between positive, healthy masculinity, um, you know, from, from our cultural, the, the cultural scripts of, like you said, the real man. How can we distinguish them and make sure that what we're following is a, a, a biblical pattern and model? And so can you just unpack a little bit as to how that biblical model should work and why it is a superior model that you've dem you've already referred to the research showing that people who who are who take their faith seriously and follow it to its logical ends produces the happiest wives i mean that's the happiest women so that's pretty powerful what is it that we need to critically understand that that flies in the face of those who would say this paternalistic idea of male headship and responsibility um, that's so damaging. What's the? Can you sort of come to the the kernel of a right understanding that changes behaviour and re reflects a better way? Yeah, because let me um, put it in context. Because I uh, in the churches today, you hear two sides. You hear on the one hand that you know that, that men are like you said overbearing and and entitled. But you also hear a lot about how churches feminize men. You know that they tell them you you know you should be you should be nice and passive, and so we need a biblical view that uh, counters both of those. And what I do in the book is I come back repeatedly to the concept of the cultural mandate. Um, you know, many people think Christianity is just about going to church on Sunday and you know maybe a Bible study and and, and um, you know personal morality. But scripture starts out in Genesis with a much bigger, much broader vision for both men and women, but we're talking about men here. And the, the cultural mandate is a term that theologians give to Genesis, where God has created the universe, he's created the animals, and then he creates the first human. And what's the first thing he says to them? He says, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. In other words, he says, why did I create you? What's your goal? What's your purpose? What's your job description? And in the streamlined language of Genesis 1, we can unpack that so that um, there's many layers. Be fruitful and multiply doesn't just mean have a family. But historically, all of the social institutions grow out of the family. Right? It becomes a clan, a village, a nation. And you need social institutions for particular purposes. You need a government. You need a church, a, sta a, a school, a marketplace. And so it's a very rich um, understanding of men Men are being called to f fill, uh, build up the entire social world. 
And subdue the earth means harness the natural resources. So that means, well, most cultures start with agriculture, but then mining and technology and uh, building buildings and inventing computers and composing music. And one of my students said, oh, oh, come on, composing music. So I said, I play the violin. What's the violin made out of? Wood. (laughs) What's the bow made out of? Horsehair. So all the transcendent beauty we associate with music starts with harnessing the raw materials of nature. And so what we need to do is help men recognize that this is the rich goal that God has put before both men and women. It's much, um, much richer than just, you know, well, did you go to church this Sunday? It's saying that your calling is to, it's called the cultural mandate because the calling is to build cultures, you know, to create civilizations, to make history. And that's a big enough vision to really match men's desire, their aspiration to have an impact, you know, to achieve mastery, to accomplish things. Um, and it's, it's, I think men are built with a desire, you know, to have that sort of a challenge. And a full Christian worldview does give that sense of masculine challenge that I think that fits, fits what men really need in terms of having a goal and a purpose and a meaning to life. I hear what you're saying, and I can imagine the critics saying, um, oh, yeah, there you go, there's that language again, subdue, you know, uh, pillage, um, uh, rape uh, the environment, um, look at the mess we've made, humanity's the problem, we're destroying the earth. It's a, it's a polar opposite in worldviews, and frankly, of course, because of our our propensity to do the wrong thing and to be greedy, we probably have overdone it at times and not looked after the environment properly. But they're very different worldviews indeed. One centred in the idea of the worth and dignity and, the, if you like, the lovability of every human being, the positive side. The other paints humanity as the problem, as the evil, as the enemy of uh, the natural order. These are becoming increasingly irreconcilable worldviews, it seems to me. And it, it, I find it very troubling because we, we almost lack the language to communicate now. Yeah, environmentalists have often gone back to Genesis 1 and misinterpreted that, you know, subdue the earth, meaning you can exploit it, you know, that you can do whatever you want with it. And you have, you have no reason to respect nature. Well, that's insane because in the scripture, it's clearly God is giving human beings stewardship. It's a delegated authority. They're not free to do whatever they want with nature. They're responsible to the creator who gave them this responsibility. It's this, If you look at the language, if you p- unpack the Hebrew words there, it talks about nurturing and caring for, uh, taking care of nature, n- treating it like a garden, right, that you cultivate. And so the language there, if you go back to the original Hebrew, has nothing to do with humans just pillaging the earth. It's been mis, but the reason it's been misunderstood is because as Western culture secularized, then secular people again took secular meanings and infused them into that language. And so it was particularly social Darwinists who basically said, We're at the top of the heap. We're at the top of the evolutionary ladder. We have the right to do whatever we want with nature. So the people who were really pillaging the earth historically, you know, the robber barons of the 19th century, were not Christian. They were social Darwinists. In fact, interestingly enough, Darwinism even had an impact on secular views of masculinity. Most people don't realize that because they think of Darwinism as a scientific theory. But the the, uh, Darwinian writers of the 19th century um, immediately began applying it to masculinity and began to say things like, the men who came out on top in the struggle for survival would be men who had were ruthless, uh, savage, barbarian, brutal, and predatory. I'm using their language. This is the language of uh, Herbert Spencer, for example, who is one of the main popularizers of Darwin's theory. So instead of urging men to live up to the image of God in them, Darwinist writers began to urge them to live down to their presumed animal nature, um, to the beast within. That was their favorite word. And by the way, that... Uh, that social Darwinism has come back. It's now called evolutionary psychology, but it's very it's very popular in some circles. There was a best selling book by an uh, evolutionary psychologist, and the the title was "The Moral Animal." And in the book, he says the human male 
is a possessive, oppressive, flesh-obsessed pig. Giving a man a book on how to have a better mar marriage is like giving a Viking a book on how not to pillage. I read this, I thought he can get away with demeaning men like this. Um, and But there's another one too. It's an older book that was just reissued by George Gilder. And he too says, men are by nature violent, irresponsible, sexually predatory. Their greatest yearning is to escape, right? escape civilization, escape the impact of women, and uh, into what he calls, and this is a direct quote, uh, a primal mode of predatory and immediate gratification. And so this is the view coming out of a secular view, uh, a Darwinian view of human nature. If you want to know what I mean when I say we want a biblical view versus a secular view, <laughs> this is a secular view right now. This is what's producing the Andrew Tates of the world. So Andrew Tate, uh, for the, the few people who may not know who he is still, um, he's very popular with young men right now. And uh, it's kind of the fast cars, fast money, fast women paradigm. And, and he's um, he was recently uh, arrested in Romania on sex trafficking charges. But he openly says, I'm a pimp. And what I do is I produce, I produce pornography. That's how I've made my money. And then he turns around and tells young men they should go out and make money like he does. Um, I, I, I was uh, talking to a former student of mine, graduate student, who now teaches at a high school. And she said, all of my male students are fans of Andrew Tate. Um, they, they use Andrew Tate quotes in the yearbook. I said, where do you teach? At a classical Christian school. So it's permeated every area of society. You know, even Christian kids are saying, you know, looking up to the Andrew Tates of the world, because they're reaching out for models of masculinity. And if we don't give them healthy models, they will be drawn to models like Andrew Tate. And uh, uh, there's a new one too. Um, the New York Post called him the new Andrew Tate. His name is Myron Gaines. And his tagline is, I turn men from simps into pimps. And he's becoming popular too. He's got millions of people on his, uh, you know, his Twitter page. So th there's a very, it's almost like we're, we're seeing a reaction against you know, we, you talked earlier about, uh, you know, the feminist denigration of the male character. Now we're seeing a, almost a reverse where men are saying, well, yeah, we are lewd, rude and crude. And that's just the male character and women have to accept it. Both Andrew Tate and Myron Gaines, for example, say men are naturally sexually promiscuous. You can't rein that in. It's impossible. It's their, it's their true nature. And women just have to learn to accept that. And if they want to be with a man like that, they just have to accept he's going to have other women on the side. So that's where the debate is today, is, you know, that Andrew Tate is becoming sort of the model for many young men. That is appalling. It, uh, it leads me to speculate that this war between the sexes, far from producing a more cooperative and operative and, 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 and accommodating society, is, is ripping it apart. I'm reminded of Warren Farrell, who uh, makes a remark that if one sex is not doing well, neither sex is doing well. And that seems to be where we've got to. Uh, and maybe part of the problem, there's another person who's very, very popular with young men right around the world. Of course, it's Jordan Peterson. He takes a very different approach. He urges young men to step up, to accept responsibility. Uh, and I think those are valuable messages. Uh, you won't find meaning without responsibility. And he touches on something else. Uh, in a conversation I had with him uh, now five, six years ago, he'd been in Australia and he broke down saying that he'd been talking to some young men in Melbourne, one of our big cities, the night before. And they'd come up to him after one of his talks. And he said, they're just so hungry for a little encouragement, a little bit of affirmation. And, and, and he became very emotional. It, it, it appeared right around the world as a little clip out of the video, the way people do it now. went, uh, I think, you know, viral, as the old saying has it. So what it seems to me, part of the problem is this antagonistic approach is driving the worst possible outcomes. We're not talking. We're not communicating. We're setting up wars everywhere, and we're getting the worst possible outcomes. Yes. Um, you mentioned Warren Farrell, and so... Um 
uh, building on that, he has written some of the best material on boys falling behind. You know, if boys are going to be attacked, uh, if masculinity is going to be undermined, what what we're seeing is that men and boys start falling behind then. Boys are falling behind in school at all levels, starting in kindergarten. <laughs> you know, they they don't have as good fine motor control. And so they can't use the scissors as well. And so all the way in kindergarten, they're starting to feel like, oh, I, you know, I'm falling behind. I'm not as good as the girls. And all the way through high school, they get worse grades and worse, worse test scores. Right now, the average university is 60% female students. 40% male. Um, and same thing with graduate school and even professional schools like law and medicine. And then when they're out of school, men are falling behind, uh, both in relation to women and in relation to where they used to be on things like uh, suicide, you know, much higher suicide, drug and alcohol addiction, homelessness, mental illness, um, unemployment. This was a, a surprise because it's not showing up the normal unemployment statistics because they've stopped looking for work. And so researchers had to dig a bit deeper and they tell us that male unemployment in the U.S. is now at Great Depression era levels, which was a shock because we all remember what a crisis the Great Depression was. And then life expectancy. Um, men's life expectancy has gone down in recent years. Women's has stayed the same. So it's not a general trend. So that a, a magazine called The New Scientist had an article on it, and it said the greatest demographic factor now in early death is being male. And so I think it's about time we had some compassion on men. I mean, the reason women got ahead in school, for example, is because we poured a lot of money into it. The Title IX in 1972, 1994, Gender Equity Act. We poured millions of dollars into equity workshops and uh, girl supportive curriculum and training materials. There's been nothing like that for boys. So it's great that women have moved ahead. Nobody expected that, by the way. They thought we'd bring up boys up to parrot, bring girls up to parity with boys. No one expected that they would just shoot right past them. But that's where it is now. Girls have shot way past the boys. And now it's time to start asking should we maybe have some special programs for boys? Should we maybe? figure out, you know, how do boys learn? You know, how can we have programs and curricula that is particularly supportive of the way boys learn in school and the way the way boys think and boys um interests and activities. I think it's time to have compassion. And I have to tell you, a lot of people have said that my book comes across as compassionate and supportive. And so I'm I'm glad to hear that. I, I really wanted it to have that tone. Um but I'm I'm calling for programs for boys now. It, it does beg the question, though, you say that uh, girls have shot past boys, but there's emerging evidence now that girls are not doing so well either. And I think I, I heard Jonathan Haidt say not so long ago that we need to realise that suddenly it's both boys and girls that are not doing very well. Well, a couple of years ago, there was a study done, and uh, it, the title was something like you know, the, the Mystery of women's increased depression. I forget the, the exact terms, but it was it was a large study that found that women's happiness has gone down. And they thought, wait, wait a minute, you know, since the feminist movement has been pushing women's rights and women have been getting out into the workplace and have been achieving higher, why is their happiness going down? So that's, I think, maybe what Jonathan Haidt was getting at. In spite of the fact that they're doing better in academia, you know, in school and moving ahead in the workplace. I'm with more female managers than male managers now. You know, at the management level, there are more females than males. So in spite of their achievements, their, uh, the studies that show happiness have gone down. But I have to tell you, there's a, 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 an organization called the Institute for Family Studies that does some really good research on this. And they have put out a couple of studies showing that the happiest women are the women who are married with children repeatedly, no matter how they phrase the questions, married women with children, you know, I'm, here, here's the graph, right? Their graph goes up to here. Married women without children is here. Unmarried women with children is here. And unmarried women without children is the lowest. And so I think that part of what's happening is um, because the age of marriage has gone up, the rate of marriage has gone way down. I think that might be a big clue 
to why women's happiness has gone down despite the fact that they're achieving more. So this leads to the question, um, uh, we've essentially, particularly in Australia, a little less so in America, but the trend lines are the same. We've always seen America as a more religious of, uh, mm-hmm. of the Western countries. But there's been a wholesale walking away from uh, the traditional beliefs of our society, that is to say Christianity. Far from producing liberation, it's, it's producing, it seems, oppression and unhappiness. And so, so in part what you're saying is that we've broken away from the idea of males as you know, protectors, providers, procreators, and having some special responsibilities. That was supposed to be liberating. It's turned out not to be liberating. Why is it, in your view, that the decline of Christianity has produced exactly the opposite of what its advocates have said it would? Well, I would say it's because Christianity is true and therefore it fits reality. You know, if you're living according to a view that's true, then you're living in line with reality. And so I I would argue that, um, you know, just go back to the basic biology. When I was writing my book, again, one of the com- most common questions I got was, well, then what do you think are the differences between men and women? Because, you know, today, if you say there's any differences, you get jumped on. Even on issues like, you know, uh, transgender people in, in women's sports, um, I have literally seen feminists saying, uh, well, women would be just as strong with men if they would just work harder. <laughs> you know, they would just work out more. No, I'm sorry. Basic biology says you know, men are bigger, stronger, faster. They have 75% more upper body muscle mass. They have 90% greater upper body strength. Um, they have more fast twitch muscles. That was the word I had to learn. It just means they can react more quickly. Um, and because of testosterone, they are, in fact, uh, more more aggressive. On general, you know, on average, um, the, more aggressive and more risk-taking than women. And I think it's time for us to just say, this is the creational givens, right? This is what God made men to be. Uh, it's basic biology. And we have to find a way to say these are good. You know, the way that God originally created men is good. And the way God created women is good. One reason that women um, are sometimes uh, resistant to, to acknowledging the differences is because as soon as you acknowledge a difference, you tend to think one is less than. I mean, that's just human, right? We, one is going to be less than. So we have to be very careful that when we talk about men, men's strengths, we talk about women's strengths. You know, women's superpower is that they have children. And they also tend to uh, test out higher on tests of emotional intelligence. By the way, they've been testing out higher on IQ tests, too, for the last 12 years or so, which is interesting. But the, the fact is that having children does, in fact, make women... Um, it, it increases their emotional sensitivity. After all, an infant, um, and by the way, Jordan, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. So he talks about this. Having an, an infant is extremely demanding. You know, it, they need things 24 hours a day. And no matter what you're doing, if an infant's in distress, you don't scold them. You don't tell them to wait until you're done with what you're doing. You know, you don't reason with them. You meet the distress, no matter what you want it to be doing. And so it creates an incredible sense of being willing to adapt to and acknowledge and respond to another human being. And of course, mothers take on the risk to their babies. You know, these babies are very helpless and vulnerable. And so mothers have to be very sensitive to threats in their environment. They have to become mama bears. And so there, we have to acknowledge that women's strengths are also strengths and acknowledging differences shouldn't be threatening because we should be able to say both of them are positives and both of them are part of the created order that, you know, was, this is pre-fall, right? This is how God originally made people. And therefore we have to say this is basically good. You know, obviously it can be distorted um, and it has been distorted, but we have to kind of get back to what, but what's the ideal? Because if you don't have an ideal, you don't know what you're working for. And so we have to acknowledge to start with just basic biology. And a lot of our psychological and social trends build off biology. Like, for example, you know, because women are the ones who are pregnant and nursing and carrying babies in a sling on their back, um, women tend to find work closer to home, always have. Um, And so even today, when women get pregnant and have children, they're more likely to cut back on their work. So we should say, well, this is good. You know, we we want 
we want parents who are deeply and engaged and committed to their children and raising them. And so all that to say, even our social and psychological aspects are often governed by or shaped by the, the biology. So let's just start with the basic biology and say these are good gifts. You know, each each of the sexes brings something good to the... It's like um, I use the analogy of the violin and the cello, since I play the violin. A cello and a violin playing a duet. You know, you, you can see the differences, but they're playing in harmony and it's beautiful. And yet we live in an age where, uh, uh, you know, the birth rate's plummeting because babies are seen as a nuisance, a problem, undesirable, threatening the planet. Uh, and if you must have them, then shove them off so that somebody else, pre preferably at state expense, can look after them. I know that's a cynical way of putting it, but you can see it in the numbers. And I can't help wondering, I think there's a bit of a fair bit of research around now indicating the very point that you've just made. Children are enormously humanizing in the best sense of the world. Uh, you know, you realize that that actually somebody had to make way for you when you came into the world. Someone had to make sacrifices for you. Someone loved you. You can't be an island. And at the other end of your life, you know, this idea that you can be lord and master over yourself in every way, your body, uh, what you do with it, uh, when you end it, when you, you know, it's, you have total control over it, you are God over yourself, flies in the face of the fact that no, you wouldn't have come into the world and survived childhood if that had been the way everybody lived. And you won't end your life very successfully if there aren't others prepared to make sacrifices and look after you. This dramatic fall in many socioeconomic groupings in the West, particularly I would suggest amongst the most successful, encourages a sort of selfishness and a hedonism that seems to lie at a lot of this dissatisfaction and disharmony. Well, since we're talking about men, um let's talk about fathers uh and what they get you i love the way you put it being a parent is very humanizing and so in my book i give a lot of studies that have come out recently on how becoming a father benefits the man Cause, right because we tend to sort of make it like you know fathers you need to be more involved uh, but i think we should motivate them by appealing to those self-interest fatherhood um they they found that uh, you you mentioned Warren Farrell. He wrote a book in which he said, when you become a father, when a man becomes a father, there are actually neurons in his brain that get activated. He called it the dad brain. Yeah. If you don't become a father, there are certain parts of your brain that never really get activated. But when you do become a father, you your brain actually grows. You actually develop more neurons, neural connections when you become a father. And also, um, hormon you, you develop hormonally as well. You know, we've always known that women, when they have babies, you know, they have hormones like oxytocin, which are called the bonding hormones, which give women a little boost in bonding to this baby so that they'll be motivated, you know, to do all the sacrifices taking care of the baby. But they, they never thought men had any hormonal changes. In fact, that's why people like Margaret Mead, you know, the famous anthropologist said, you know, motherhood is natural. The fatherhood is not. It's a, it's a show. It's a cultural convention, a cultural in, invention, in fact. And I'm, I argue in the book, no, it's not. It's, it's totally natural to men as well. Because if you tell them it's not natural to them, you will undercut their motivation, right, for becoming fathers. So I think it's important for men to realize, no, it's natural to you as well. And what they discovered is that uh, at birth, um, a man's oxytocin goes up as well. In other words, he too is getting a biochemical boost to become a more involved and engaged father. Uh, it only, it, it's, it's, motor, it's um, stimulated by tactile sensations. And so the man has to be actually holding and cuddling and playing with his baby. But if he does, his oxytocin goes up just like the mother's does to help him bond to his baby. And then the real surprise is the most recent study I found was by an anthropologist who found that a father's oxytocin is going up all through his wife's pregnancy. And that was a surprise. I, I don't think anyone ever thought to test a man's blood during his wife's pregnancy. But when they did, they found out that all through her pregnancy, he's becoming biochemically primed to be a full, involved member of the parenting partnership. And so men themselves, and, and I have lots of quotes from men too, you know, from surveys, Men who say becoming a father was the best thing I ever did. John Lennon. <laughs> we all know who John Lennon was. So he was in a support group once and he was asked, 
uh, Warren Farrell tells this story, by the way. Um, he was in a support group and he was asked, what's the biggest hole in your heart? And he said, the biggest hole in my heart is I was not there for my first son. And so with his second son, he decided to take off work for five years and be the primary parent. And so Warren Farrell asks him how that turned out. John Lennon says, best decision I ever made. And then he said, I never knew what love was until I really was an involved father with my son. And so, and he's not the only one. I have several quotes from men saying, I had no idea being a father would change me so much that I would find it so fulfilling. And um, one, one pastor actually, uh, he, he, he became a father a little bit later in life for the first, for the first time. And he said, how come nobody told me? I feel cheated. I feel cheated. Nobody told me how much fatherhood would make me feel like a fuller human being. You know, I feel like a fully a man now that I'm a father. So in my book, I try to give men, you know, the positive affirmation that will motivate them to become fathers. That's really very interesting, isn't it? And I, and I take it we'd both agree, though, that, that it needs to be exercised responsibly. You know, you know this idea, the Andrew Tate idea that, oh, you know, go out there, be promiscuous, run the risk of fathering children everywhere and then not be involved just absolutely destroys the model for the father and the child. Um, yeah, interesting yes. and just he does to pick have, up on... Sorry? Uh, he does have several children, by the way, who he is not fathering. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and that's a tragedy of those children, but also for him and for the others who are influenced by that model, let it be said. Warren Farrell, I think I'm right in understanding. I mean, his book, The Boy Crisis, I think you would all agree is everyone should read it. Everyone should read that book. But he makes that point that that sort of tripping into place of the dad brain brings into place instinctive um, teaching ability that the dad's not even aware of. They just instinctively will horseplay with their children, for example, in a way which encourages them to learn how to delay gratification. And that is one of the absolute critical elements of a successful life. Again, highlighting the complementarity, if you like, of the mum and dad roles that our culture seems to be determined to write off and to dismiss and to mock out of existence. Yeah, so one of the things I deal with is why is it that we have such a negative view of fathers? You know, in the media, fathers are regularly mocked and ridiculed, the butt of the joke, you know, the, the Homer Simpson model, um, you know, the, the father's always the dimwit dad. And my, my, one of my sons really loved the Berenstein Bears, and I don't know if you've read those, but the father's always the doofus. You know, he's, even, even the kids laugh at him and make fun of him. And, and so, I think that's another thing we need to address is, you know, men are not going to be motivated to become fathers if fatherhood itself is not respected, you know, if it's not given a, accorded dignity and value. And so I ask why that happened. And again, uh, we have to go back to the Industrial Revolution because when fathers were taken out of the home, you know, for the first time, uh, they were no longer there as fathers. Uh, for the first time, Boys were growing up without close relationships and supervision by their fathers. Yeah, we're so used to it now that we don't realize, again, you have to go back to the 19th century and read the literature. They were shocked. They were shocked that fathers were no longer there. Uh, the leading psychologist of the 19th century said, our boys are growing up half orphaned, half orphaned, because their fathers are not there day in and day out. Or you find other people... Um, a, a, a parents magazine back then said the greatest source of domestic sorrow these days is that fathers can't be home with their kids anymore. And we talked about the uh, temperance movement. The founder of the temperance movement said, you know, the, f the father is meant to be like the prototype of God in the family. And yet he's not there from Sunday to Sunday. You know? uh, um, so at the time it was a great shock that that men were no longer closely connected to their sons. And so I do have a whole chapter in the book giving practical, you know, you, you have to give some practical solutions as well. And so I talk about ways in which uh, men have worked to flex the workplace a bit, be home more. And, and the pandemic was actually a game changer because a lot of fathers discovered they actually liked being closer to their kids. Harvard University actually did a study 
um, in which they, the conclusion was uh, 68% of fathers said, during the pandemic, I got closer to my children and I don't want to lose that. You know, I, I want to have some kind of a maybe hybrid s- set up at work, some kind of an arrangement. Um, and even even leaving, you know, work a few days early, I had a, a graduate student, a, ma- a, a man who um, just left work a few days early to coach his son's soccer and basketball teams. His boss uh, accused him of coasting, but he said it did not harm his career. And when his children grew up, they said, we want to be a dad like you, which is a lot better than any workplace accolades. So I do I do look at some ways in which fathers um, can, can maybe make room, even in our industrial age. Um, and, I, and I quote CEOs, too, who say it works. You know, you've got to p- persuade business and corporations as well that this is going to work. I quote one CEO who said, before the pandemic, of course, we were afraid to try remote, remote work because we thought we would lose productivity. You know, they would slough off. They wouldn't work. He said, and this is a direct quote, he said, the pandemic has completely exploded that fear. We did not see any drop in productivity. You know, in, in fact, if anything, when when they don't have to spend time getting dressed and sitting in traffic, we get more work out of them when they're working from home um, and not being interrupted by constant meetings and so on. And so I think that, you know, take take the book into your to your boss and show, hey, look, you know, this actually. Even the CEOs are saying, yes, this does work. That, as one CEO put it, if you give parents time to be good parents, like not staying late, not working till midnight, not coming in on the weekends, but prioritizing their family, if you give them time to be better parents, they are, in fact, better workers. She, uh, this was a CEO who is, uh, she wrote the, an article that was the most widely read article in the whole history of the Atlantic magazine. And her argument was, if you have family responsibilities, I expect you to take care of them because I know you will ultimately do better at work when your family is thriving. So it's a win-win for both sides. uh, You've given us a a great deal to think about. And now, of course, many of the things we've been talking about, let's face it, are quite countercultural. Now, one of the things that you've you've said, and uh, I've I've seen research that certainly convinces me that what you're saying is absolutely right, and my life experience is just the same, that people who take their faith seriously, uh, you know, you're getting better outcomes in terms of both, you know, men and women. But I wonder whether there isn't a problem where many churches actually have fallen into this trap of not properly affirming and and, and explaining and teaching up and uh, encouraging, if you like, goodness in men, and you've seen, how can I put this? Uh, no other way to put it, a feminization of the church, I think, that means that a lot of men don't feel comfortable there, so they're not going as often as, as women. Um, how do we address that issue? Because part of what you're saying is that a real Christianity is very important uh, for, for, for better outcomes, uh, but it's probably not looking that way to a lot of people who might be listening to this conversation. It seems counterintuitive. Yes, well, there's been, people have con- been concerned about the feminization of the church. Well, actually, b- back to the beginning, Rodney Stark, who's a sociologist of religion, says even in the early church, there were more more women than men. And why was that? Well, in one sense, it was a good thing because what it meant was that the church had such a high view of women that it was very attractive to women uh, compared to the Greco-Roman culture um, where women had very low status. You know, men had men had wives in order to have legal heirs, but there was no expectation that there would be love and intimacy in marriage. You know, for, for their sexual satisfaction, it was totally accepted that men would would have mistresses and prostitutes and courtesans and uh, um, go to brothels and slaves. You know, the most common form of um, adultery actually was with slaves because they were handy. They're right in your household. Um, And by the way, homosexuality was common as well. So uh, a wife was not competing only with other women. She was competing with other men for her husband's attention. In fact, uh, in my earlier book, Love Thy Body, I quote a Roman poet who actually chastises a woman, a wife, 
uh, for being jealous of her husband because he was having sex with the slave boys. And he sa- he chastises her and says, you know that sex with boys is, is more satisfying than sex with women, so you should just put up with it. So that's what women were facing in the first century. And when they entered the Christian church, they had much higher status and much more security in their marriages than in the surrounding culture. So it has actually been um, an issue from the beginning that there were more women than men. But partly that's for good reasons, because the church has such a high view of women. And Jesus himself, of course, uh, treated women with a dignity that they were not used to as well. You know, um, just the, uh, I think of, for example, there's things that we don't even know. For example, um, you know, you were not supposed to talk to women in public, even in the Jewish culture, not just not to mention the Roman culture. Um, but Jesus talked to women in public. You weren't supposed to, you certainly weren't supposed to touch them. But when Jesus healed people, he often laid hands on them. Like Peter's mother-in-law, it says specifically, he laid hands on her. Um, and even, even um, when Jesus uh, welcomed the children, I love this story because we t- we tend to think of it as sort of a sentimental Sunday school Victorian story where Jesus has the little children on his lap. That was actually an incredibly countercultural statement that Jesus was making, because in Roman culture, children had very little value. They were considered non-persons. Um, fathers could kill their children for any reason or no reason, you know, legally. He, he had complete legal right to kill his children, and he did. Um, and uh, infanticide and abortion were very common, uh, so children were often killed. And by the way, mostly girl children. Uh, it was very unusual for a Roman family to have more than one daughter because daughters were so devalued um, that they would often be killed through abortion or infanticide. Um, but just the very fact that um, that children have so little value. There's a whole book on the subject called uh, about how Christianity invented childhood because. Before that, they did not have the notion that children were these special, precious beings that we should cherish. So when it makes more sense then that the disciples, remember when the mothers brought their children, and by the way, it doesn't say mothers, so it might have been fathers too. When the parents brought their children, uh, the disciples said, get rid of these kids. You know, why are you spending time with them? And Jesus had to rebuke them and scold them and chastise them. And say no, no, no. We have to, we have to love and care for our children. And in fact, if you don't ex- remember, he, he used phrases like, "If you don't accept, uh, if you don't enter the kingdom of God like a little child, you're not going to make it." And you can see the church fathers later saying, "What in the world did he mean by that?" Because no one had ever held up children as a model for adults, never. So there's whole dimensions in the Bible of issues that we don't even realize. That Jesus was making an incredibly countercultural statement by just valuing children. And so if we go back to the scripture and we read it, sometimes we find out, you know, there there are messages there for, well, for both men and women, um, that um that the church has has kind of lost over time. You know, we lost a lot of it in the Victorian age when that's the age when we so, uh, the, the, there was a, a very a very famous prayer: "Little Jesus, meek and mild, no, tender Jesus, meek and mild, look on me, a little child." You know the Jesus meek and mild image, um, at, which I think we're still kind of going up against today. And historically, if you see where it came from, it's it's a little easier to counter it today. And we're not Victorians anymore, and and we need to recover a, a much more robust biblical understanding of masculinity. Well, I think uh, you've been very, very generous with your time. You've given us some tremendous insights. I find myself often saying to people now who might say my beliefs are somehow out of order and not relevant, look at all the trouble they create and all the the lines that you get, uh, responding as gently as I can, well, you know, uh, know, you've adopted the zeitgeist of the age. How's that working out? We seem to be incredibly unhappy. We're all uh, in conflict with one another. Uh, if I could give you the last word, uh, what, a, what, what encouragement would you give to young people in particular now to say, go back and have an honest look uh, at the wellspring of our culture, which is Christianity, because it's actually not what you think it is. How would you encourage them to do that? 
Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, and and I'll, you know, I'll start with basic apologetics. Apologetics is you know defending um, defending your beliefs. That's that's what the word means. And um, I've been in a lot of debates with uh, non Christians, you know, who say, well, you know, we we basically came from uh, a completely materialist world. No, they have a materialist worldview where the source of human life itself is blind, material, purposeless forces. And I say, well, we are personal beings. In, in philosophy, personal doesn't mean warm and friendly. A personal being is one that thinks, acts, feels, chooses, wills, as opposed to a non-personal force, right? Or uh, l- like electricity or like Star Wars, right? This, the force be with you. Um, and um, uh, most of our modern secular worldviews say, well, we're the product of mindless, meaningless, purposeless forces. And I say, well, how does a mindless force produce beings with minds? You know, how does a purposeless force create beings who have purposes? You know, how does a force that's, that you know, that that can't choose, that's not a will, you know, creates people who can choose? You know, it's just it's not logical. And so I I think that. So with a lot of people, we have to kind of go back to the first step. And why is Christianity even true? Well, the, the reason is it answers the questions better than any other worldview. It can explain why we exist. There's a, a French philosopher, Etienne Gilson, um, a French philosopher who puts it this way. He says, the fact that we are, are cap- the humans are capable of thinking means that the first cause that created us must have a mind. The reason that we are the, the fact that we are capable of choosing means the first cause that created us must have a will. Or to summarize it, because we are a, you know, the human being is a someone and not a something, um, the first cause that created us must be a someone. And so that means that Christianity uh, affirms and supports the things that are the most important to us as people. Because, right? If you if you are a consistent materialist, and, and I I quote these guys, these consistent materialists all the time, so they're out there. Many of our leading scientists. Okay, I'll give you an example. There's a brand new book by a Stanford biologist, and it's called Determined, and the subtitle is something like you know why we have no free will. So he believes uh, we're created by mindless, purposeless forces, and therefore we are basically complex biochemical machines. And that there is no such thing as free will. Well, why would anyone want to? Why would anyone be attracted to such a worldview? It's very demeaning. It's very dehumanizing. Christianity actually gives a much higher view of the human person because it affirms those things that are that are, that give us meaning to life. You know, the uh, love and communication and relationship and purpose and meaning. Christianity affirms all of these, whereas the typical secular view does not. And the, the current that current book I mentioned, by the way, is, is is just one. There's a book by a Harvard psychologist called The Illusion of Conscious Will, arguing again that there's no such thing as free will or basically complex machines. Steven Pinker at Harvard uh, is best, has written best-selling books, arguing that uh, the, the, the best known is how the mind works. And he argues that we're just complex data processing machines. And you ask these guys, well, how do you live that way? How can you live on a worldview that doesn't affirm who we really are? And you know what Stephen Pinker says? Well, in the lab, I treat people as complex data processing machines. And then when we go home for the night, you know, take off our lab coats. And this is a direct quote. We go back to treating one another as free and dignified human beings. In other words, he's acknowledging his worldview doesn't work in the real world. He's acknowledging that when he goes home at night, he can't treat his wife like a complex data processing machine. You know, he'd better not. So he has to shift. He has to shift to a worldview that's essentially Christianity that says we're made in the image of a personal God. And these, the personal dimension to us is what's most important. And, you know, Christianity then has an answer, has an explanation of why we are who we are that the secular worldviews don't. And what is the purpose of a worldview anyway? It's to explain the world. And Christianity does a much better job of explaining the world, especially the human world, than any other worldview. Well, that's gold. Thank you so much, Professor Nancy Pearson from Houston, uh, talking to me here in the eastern part of Australia for your time today. It's been excellent. Thank you. I enjoyed speaking with you.